Now, according to the Global Cybersecurity Index, about 1 billion people worldwide became internet users for the first time between 2015 and 2019. These users, according to the report, counted on government to enhance cybersecurity norms and protect the increasingly exposed personal and financial data owing to global losses due to cybercrime. Here in Ghana, we've launched the new cybersecurity law, which is expected to deal with the growing concerns of crime associated with it. This afternoon, we would like to have a conversation looking at this law, its implications as associated, uh, uh, as well as associated sanction regimes. Joining me via Zoom for this discussion is a National Cybersecurity Advisor, Dr. Albert Enchi Wesiako. Uh, Doc, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Let's start uh, uh, by congratulating you on Ghana's ranking as the third in Africa when it comes to a global cybersecurity index. First of all, what do you think accounted for this ranking? Uh, Madam Gift, to thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to your viewers. And uh, we appreciate your comment with respect to what Ghana has achieved together. I must first of all say it's a collective achievement uh, because for the past four years, uh, the government has worked closely with the private sector uh, to implement certain, uh, what I call the building blocks. And that has received international recognition. Uh, let's look at what ITU stands for. It's a global regulator of, of the ICT sector, of which cyber security is a subsector uh, in this particular area. But the, the most important thing is how significant to us as a country, um, indeed, being third on the African continent uh, and number 43 globally is not uh, to say we are immune to cyber attacks, not at all. But uh, it tells a story that within the last four years, the government is doing so well in putting the necessary structures in place by way of reg um, legislative framework, by way of organizational measures, capacity building. So it, it tells us we are about 8 to 6 percent ready to be able to exercise the activity relative to cybersecurity. For example, you mentioned about this law. It contributed to our, uh, I mean, our ranking globally because we are among the few countries on the African continent, possibly the topmost, to have such a comprehensive legislation. But why does it matter? You are, we're talking of, let's say, standardization. You need a law that will provide a framework to be able to standardize cybersecurity practices. So I think it's, it's quite huge. And um, it is based on what the government has implemented over the last um, uh, four years. I think the Minister for Communications, Honorable Eslo Usu Ekufo, is quite grateful uh, to the seventh parliament. Uh, the law was passed through bipartisan uh, approach. And, and that is something that we need to bring uh, to bear. And of course, after cabinet approval, parliament took this up uh, and, and we've been able to get it. But once again, a number of agencies were involved in the in the drafting and the passage of the law. We're talking of BNI, NCA, NITA, Digital Protection Commission, uh, the National Security Outfit itself, private sector players, uh, industry, uh, telecommunications chamber, the civil society group. So I think in our international partners, the US government, the UK government, the government of Israel. And I think that is where the credit should go. But really, indeed, it tells the story that Ghana is taking serious steps to build its cyber security readiness in view of our current digital transformation agenda. Gifty, thank you once again mm. for bringing that in perspective. Pretty elaborate uh, one there. But let's look at the current standards when it comes to the new law. Um, individually and as organizations, what should people look out for as far as this new law is concerned? Okay. Uh, I think there are quite a lot. Uh, if you thanks for the question. Really, the law establishes a regulatory framework. So by that perspective, you expect that there will be a lot of uh, uh, standards or expectations. But I think the most critical one uh, for a digital economy to survive is um, the question that borders on the critical information infrastructure. So we look at section 35 to 40 of the Act. Uh, there are certain ICT infrastructures, databases, networks that are so critical to our well-being, and of course, uh, for our national security. So we're talking about the banking environment, 
the telecommunication infrastructure, critical government infrastructures, paperless port system, mobile money interoperability infrastructure, national ID system, the lecturer databases, the water system, the energy, the mining, manufacturing, water, and, and so on and so forth. These are critical systems that any attempt or successful um, activity that will compromise their confidentiality, their integrity, or their availability itself could have impact both on our economic and social lives. Also, they could actually impact on our national security. In view of that, there are certain standards that have been uh, introduced into the acts by way of designation, by way of registration and risk management approaches that businesses who falls into this category will have to uh, adopt certain indeed gifty in the coming weeks the sector minister will outline certain interventions by way of designation and businesses will have to comply to ensure that we have the best protection around these critical systems we need this to be able to guarantee the smooth uh, operations of our digital economy in this particular case. That goes to certain businesses that falls into this category. But you did also ask the question about individuals. Mm -hmm. Of course, individuals were by way of standards. For example, if we're a cyber security practitioner, let me put it lightly. Somebody says I'm ethical hacker. I, mm -hmm. I think there's a licensing regime that people who are going to exercise the business of cyber security will have to be are regulated in court. Why is a sensitive area, it's a security area, the state needs to have visibility. It is also good to even develop the ecosystem and, and, and that is one area that will also have implications. But apart mm. from that, individually, I think there are certain uh, criminal offenses. One of the areas is uh, mostly sexual offenses. That has really, I want to bring this up because the National Cyber Street Center collate results. And if you take online impersonation, the second most um, reported incident is, is mainly sexual offenses by way of reporting uh, people's leaking intimate images or videos. Mm -hmm. And the law is quite clear in this particular case. Uh, if you take uh, section 62 to 68, there are certain offenses that we need to be very careful, even by way of just a threat to distribute certain images could carry up to about three years mm. uh, in, in prison term. I think we need to also look at it because sometimes we feel like this is just a lighter issue. A teenager or a man is threatening the girlfriend for living. And if you don't come back, I'm going to distribute your picture. I think this could lead you. Okay. But where there is even an extortion, there's element of extortion in this whole dynamics uh, could actually get somebody to about 25 years in prison. So these are some of the implications of the law that we need to uh, we need to know. I want to talk about a bit about um, cyberbullying. But before that, you mentioned, with the highlight that you mentioned and what you said the sector minister will be doing soon, there have been concerns about, um, you know, protection of privacy, you know, when it comes to government's oversight responsibilities of the cyber space. And so I just wanted a bit of clarity there about right. the... Uh, the extent to which the law also protects people's privacies and the concerns about political targeting. How does it remove all of these things? All right. I, you know, the gift you thank you, I think, of course, the citizens always have a legitimate concern to express these views. There is always the need for a delicate balance, the balance between the interest, the state responsibility to protect its citizens. That is one and the citizens' right to live their normal lives, even digital right to ensure that they are protected. We always need to have those conversations, you know, alongside. You can't treat one uh, uh, at the expense of the other, okay? So I call those uh, a balance that needs to be looked at it. Now, how is that principle translated into the Cyber Security Act, which we're talking about? Yeah. I think one area I would like to point out as the investigatory powers that are granted under the law, okay. section 69 to 65 provides certain mechanism by which law enforcement can assess data, legitimate work of investigations. You need that to protect the citizens as well. Okay. Now, when you look at our law, there are elaborate provisions how 
well, let's say CID or BNI or any of the investigating bodies be able to even assess your subscriber information. Let me put it that way. Subscriber information means that you registered a SIM card with MTN. There are legal mechanisms by which officers of the law will have to follow proof before a court to obtain a warrant to assess that information. Mm. That is an important factor here. It's not just automatic in our request. But the law has also a certain uh, integration here by way of what we call inspectors. Uh, there are certain integration, the function, uh, if you look at us in 18 and 19, we've introduced inspectors who has a responsibility to ensure that even in following the legal procedure to assess that critical information that is necessary mm -hmm. for prevention of crime and the protection of our citizens, they can go in to investigate any potential abuse. So I, I think it's a question of strengthening the various checks and balances. The Data Protection Act, Act 843, I think clearly spells out the citizens' um, protection, the rights under data, I mean, they are right, even in the digital space. Okay. But the most important thing is this law is quite elaborate and even before a law enforcement agency obtains any information, it has to go through a rigorous process to prove before it. A court of law that before brings that information me to, can be obtained. That brings me to how individuals can then lodge complaints. Is there a, a, a lay down procedure through which individuals can complain when they feel that they're being, yeah? All right. That, that's very important. The, the complaint mechanisms uh, with respect to uh, privacy abuses are addressed by the Data Protection Act, Act 843, and, and no law can take that. Uh, power is granted under the law from the Data Protection Act. So that remains the procedure. And I believe uh, the, the public and, and the citizens should read that particular, because that really empowers them to exercise their rights in terms of data protection rights. But what I want to bring to your attention is mm -hmm. this Cyber Treaty Act provides another mechanism for joint cooperation uh, with the Data Protection uh, Commission. For example, if you take Section 13 of the Act, there is a joint cyber security committee which is represented by the data protection commission so some of these issues are also discussed at that level together with other agencies and in some cases the private sector to address certain concerns that may arise relative to the implementation uh, of the law mm, interesting um I, we, we've spent quite some time on this but as you said the law itself is elaborated it's got a lot of uh, information that ought to be uh, broken down. How soon do we expect the sector minister to roll this out? Uh, I mean, how soon do we expect all of these to become uh, reality? All right, that, that, that's, that's, that's a good one. It's a good question. That's a challenge because one, uh, we are excited that we put the necessary building blocks. I think that's the most important thing. Now to sustain that, uh, it requires effective implementation of this whole law. Uh, I, I want to be very kind. Without effective implementation, I don't think we're going to stay even where we are. We will actually come back if you look at the rate of digitization. So I think it's good gifted to, to inquire as to what is being done. Currently, there are a lot of internal processes ongoing uh, because you are setting up an authority. In fact, the center here is going to transition into the cyber security authority and a lot of internal processes are being done. I believe in a matter of weeks, I won't say months. Uh, once again, minister will also have to run processes through cabinet for um, cabinet information or cabinet approvals. So, mm. but one thing is clear, before the end of the year, you see um, this law come into full force with respect to the regulatory interventions that the minister is empowered uh, to, to, to do in this particular case. Doc, thank you very much this afternoon for breaking it down for us. Even if it's not all the information, we we're, we're appreciate it. Dr. Albert Enjubwesiako is the National Cybersecurity Advisor there, helping us to understand our new cybersecurity regulations as we go along. Doc, thank you once again.